Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our license plate recognition workshop. Within this workshop, we hope to give you a fantastic introduction to Red Hat OpenShift data science. Joining me today are my colleagues, Erwan and Carl, but let's go ahead and uh, introduce ourselves. I can go first. My name is Carl Eklund. I'm an architect here at Red Hat, working on the Red Hat OpenShift data science team. So it's a very exciting platform, and we're excited to show you uh, what we have for you today. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Erwin Granger. I'm also an architect uh, working for Red Hat, and I look forward to uh, working with you on this today. And good morning. My name is Audrey Resnick. I'm a data scientist. I'm working for Red Hat and just joined uh, last year. And I'm looking forward to going uh, over this workshop with you. So with that, let's take a look at the agenda that we're going to be going over with today. What we want you to experience today is how Red, Sh Red Hat OpenShift makes it very easy to get started and to get going rapidly to develop, test, and train models. To do that, we're going to show you how Red Hat OpenShift Data Science allows your data scientists uh, to obtain the tools and technologies that they need to actually get their jobs done. Of course, specifically, we're going to be looking at the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science platform, and we're going to use that to recognize license plates in car pictures and extract the number from an identified license plate. Now, throughout this workshop, we're gonna be here to help you out and to answer questions. But first, let's take a look at what Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, the product actually is. Now, I've got a blurb here from our main page, but essentially, uh, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science really enables companies and their data scientists to solve critical business challenges or problems. And that's by providing a fully managed cloud environment on Red Hat OpenShift dedicated or the Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS. Essentially what this allows uh, the data scientists to do is to carry out their machine learning workflow without having to become an OpenShift expert. Uh, being a data scientist myself, I do appreciate that because at the end of the day, I just want to work on my code and I don't want to really worry about the infrastructure. I just want to have the tools available so that I can actually go ahead and get my work done. With Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, you're able to quickly create models. Uh, we're going to be using Jupyter Notebooks today, but within those Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you could have TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, you can also use um, NVIDIA GPUs, and all of that is without, again, worrying about that underlying infrastructure. Mind you, if you're in DevOps, you'll be interested about that, so we'll talk a little bit about that underlying infrastructure. Really what we want to do at the end of the day is to be able to consistently export these models to production in what we call a container-ready format. If you have something in a container-ready format, you're going to be able to export those models across uh, hybrid cloud, um, multi-cloud environments and edge environments. And Red Hat OpenShift Data Science really provides uh, the data scientists access to these hybrid cloud services and compute acceleration, uh, for example, the NVIDIA GPUs, without having to file a ticket with IT. So how many of us have been in an environment where we wanted to do something and we have to file a ticket and then you wait one or two days? That's not fun. So we're hoping that this Red Hat OpenShift environment will give you the power to basically go ahead to do what you want to without having to file that ticket uh, with IT. So the easiest way to understand the Red Hat OpenShift data science platform is to think about the various tasks that data scientists need to perform when they're building and deploying a model. And we've broken down these tasks into four steps. We're going to look at each of these tasks individually. So the first one is to extract and transform the data. And this is all going to start with data acquisition. 
where we extract and transform the data. Now, the data engineers can go ahead and integrate the streaming data from uh, OpenShift Apache streams for Kafka or reaching out across the hybrid cloud to pull in data for analysis from multiple platforms and data sources. The data engineers can then also work on gathering and preparing the data to make it ready for the data scientists to go ahead and start experimenting and creating their machine learning models. And an example of a managed service we'll be talking about those is an item that they could use is Starburst Galaxy. Uh, so for example, Starburst Galaxy is what we call a fully managed service to access your data using Trino. Um, that's a premier uh, SQL engine and it's fast, uh, gives you fast uh, access and flexible management of your data. The next task or uh, the next portion of developing a models is be able to run experiments and develop models. So the data scientists want to develop the machine learning models. And an example of a managed service here that you would use would be Jupyter Hub. You're actually going to try this out in the workshop. And that's going to allow you to create multiple Jupyter notebooks for your experiments. Of course, if you're like me, you're gonna start off in one notebook and go, oh, I got another idea. And you're going to lift part of that code uh, into your next notebook and continue on with your experimentation until you feel that the model is at a stage where you want to try deploying it. Now, with the Jupyter Notebooks, you can pick which packages and libraries for Python uh, that you're going to find useful to work with for your particular problem. So you may experiment with numerous packages such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, and, and others. The next step is to deploy models in an application. Uh, you can really simplify and accelerate the process of actually deploying and manage, managing your machine learning models. Uh, once you have them developed, you can use what we're going to use today, which is our source to image templates to deploy uh, an endpoint for testing. Uh, within uh, the Red Hat OpenShift data science platform, you could also have services such as Selden deploy for model serving. Typically, your models are going to be contained in what we call intelligent applications. And those are deployed and then the machine learning models will start inferencing or making predictions based on any of the new data that that model may see. And of course, if you use a managed service such as Selden Deploy, that's going to help you also build your pipelines uh, to deploy your models. So let's take a look at the fourth and final task, and that's really to monitor the models and track performance. So your work isn't gonna stop once your model is deployed. You have to continuously model, model, you have to continuously monitor and manage your model in production to make sure that those models are making the right predictions. And when you're taking a look at the, the models, you have to have some way to monitor them and track performance because if your model starts to drift, you want to have some sort of alert that occurs. And if there's drift that occurs along with that monitoring, you should be able to retrain that model easily. And again, you can continue to use a service such as Selden Deploy or even Watson Machine Learning and Watson OpenScale for model monitoring. and performance tracking to know when you need to retrain and deploy. Now, when we look at the overall picture here for a data scientist with these services, we're looking for flexibility for the data scientist. Now, keep in mind that for any IT ops or DevOps, flexibility can actually be a nightmare because they want a very reliable, stable, reproducible environment, as well as that stable, reproducible infrastructure for their customers. And we're going to address that next as we look at the underlying infrastructure for this Red Hat OpenShift data science platform. So if you're a data scientist, you can kind of tune out a little bit, but if you're in DevOps or IT interested in what the underlying structure is, you'll probably want to pay attention. At the very bottom, we're going to have the main infrastructure or hybrid cloud platform. And it should consist of um, a very consistent experience across 
on on prem in public clouds and with the public cloud of course we're going to be uh, on aws and edge locations and this all should be efficiently and easily managed by it operations the next layer is the compute acceleration so the hybrid cloud should have interactions with hardware accelerators we use nvidia gpus to help speed up the machine learning model and for the development and any of the inferencing tasks that the model needs to do. And then we have these self-managed services. This has to be, these self-managed services, they have to be supported on the self-service hybrid multi-cloud platform. And that should empower the data scientists and data engineers and the software developers to be very agile and collaborative throughout the whole process. Uh, the way that they're really going to be able to be collaborative is to use a number of the open source tools and capabilities that we have. And again, that's all without depending too much on IT operations for individual tasks. Remember, we want to avoid opening a lot of tickets so that we can go ahead and start getting our, our work done. Let's just uh, take a look, a closer look at these tools and capabilities that we're talking about. So when we talk about tools and capabilities, we really want to deliver common data science tools as the main foundation of uh, the AI as a service platform that's integrated with our partner cloud services. If we extend these tool, tools further by adding open source and partner tools, we can do this through a shared UI. And you'll be looking at the UI shortly when we start our, our workshop. But if we take a look at some of the tools and capabilities that you're working with today, we'll be uh, looking at Jupyter Notebooks. So within Jupyter Lab, we'll use Jupyter Notebooks, and that's going to be to conduct your exploratory data science on these Jupyter uh, Notebooks uh, that will talk about the license, or that will demonstrate some of the code that we've built for the license plate. Uh, workshop. So again, an example of the managed service, which is Jupyter Hub, and that allows you to create many Jupyter notebooks for your experimentation. And while we're in Jupyter Hub, you can determine which packages or libraries for Python would be useful for you to work with. So you may want to experiment with TensorFlow, PyTorch, many of the other packages that may be available. Uh, in our instance, we're going to be working with TensorFlow today. Then we have source to image. Once you go ahead and have your models developed, you can use our source to image templates to deploy uh, and endpoints for testing. And of course, you do have access to Selden Deploy uh, for model serving. Actually, I should mention Selden Deploy is coming up in a, in a future version. For right now, we're going to be uh, using source to image. And typically, again, as I mentioned, your models will be contained in an intelligent application uh, that is going to be deployed. Uh, so you'll want to have uh, the models start inferencing and making productions on any of the new data that they observe. So that's really, really nice, but you're gonna ask yourself, what do these features actually do for us? What do these services actually do for us? So there are, four key features that were, were kind of given that we should really consider. The first of all is with the managed cloud service, there's no managing infrastructure, which is really helpful. We have increased capabilities and collaboration. So we have access to this whole ecosystem uh, or open source ecosystem that has what we call ISV or internet service vendor certified software that's available on Red Hat Marketplace. And then we also support core data science workflows. And this is from, again, from developing a model to integrating it as part of a larger application. And Rhodes, Rhodes Red Hat uh, OpenShift Data Science is really ideal for that rapid experimentation that you're doing. You can take things that you've developed on the platform and export them and run them elsewhere, whether it's on-prem or if you're going to be wanting to uh, do something in the public cloud arena. Again, 
in our instance, we're going to be using AWS. And I'd like to make this one statement here is remember, you don't want to tie yourself to one cloud vendor. You should have the flexibility to move your solutions back on prem or to another cloud vendor or provider. And you can actually accomplish that with uh, the way that we go ahead and build containers uh, for your for your applications or solutions. So at this point in time, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science is in beta and we have some initial release components. So we do have uh, internet uh, service vendors um, as a service. So you're going to be able to uh, go ahead and see uh, Jupyter Hub, um, be able to uh, in Jupyter Hub, go ahead and create Jupyter notebooks uh, that you would use for your experimentation. We do have also Red Hat OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka and the Red Hat OpenShift data science. Again, that's what we're going to be looking at today. And remember, all of this is going to be sitting on top of your managed cloud services. Uh, for our instance, the Red Hat OpenShift uh, data science service is going to be on uh, the Amazon Web Services. And with that, you're going to have compute acceleration. So again, you're going to have access, not in this workshop, but you would have access to um, GP, er, GPUs or certain NVIDIA GPUs. And then finally, you have your, your cloud infrastructure. Now, in the future, uh, when we fully integrate our partner ecosystem, uh, you're going to have customer managed internet service vendor software and internet service vendor managed cloud services. So you're going to have a plethora of tools to actually choose from. And you're going to have a very rich platform where you can pick and choose the services and applications that, again, make the most sense for your particular business problem. So with that overview, let's take a look at what we're going to be doing in our license plate detection workshop. So this license plate detection workshop is a project actually that's being undertaken by one of our colleagues, Guillaume Moutier for Metro London. And the main objective is to monitor the traffic movement, car registration fees through license plate detection. We have a machine learning model that will actually detect the license plate on a vehicle. And if the vehicle is angled, the license plate is going to be righted, and then the characters are going to be gathered through the machine learning that we have in our model. Once we extract those characters, that data is then stored, read, or analyzed through Kafka. Uh, just for folks who don't know about Kafka, that's an open source software that provides a really good framework for reading, or I should say storing, reading, and analyzing streaming data. So for this instance, what we could do is we could be looking for a particular license plate and you may actually go ahead and throw an amber alert uh, for an identified plate that is of interest to the local authorities. We can go ahead then and data is then stored and read and analyzed through Kafka. And um, as I mentioned, we could have the amber alerts but at the end of the day, what we want to do is really then just store the data. And um, we could create a vehicle registration database that would contain all the license plates of the vehicles uh, that we've captured going through the Metro London area. And then finally, we could go ahead and perform business uh, analysts, uh, business intelligence and uh, look at analytics tools that would further look at this data that we've stored so that we could really get a better idea of say of traffic movement within certain parts of the city can determine if some areas are congested and we could also determine if we need more parking within an area that's a really rough overview what we would like you guys to do now is to type in the following URL, that's uh, bit.ly slash ODS dash sign up. What that's going to do is it's going to take you to a spreadsheet. 
And we're using the spreadsheet to track how you are going to be uh, getting a username and password uh, for this workshop. And for example here, uh, when you come into this spreadsheet, we want you to put down your first name and last name. That's gonna be associated with the username and password. Password is the same for everybody, it's Rhodes Demo. So for example, I entered Kathy Smith. She would be using username user2, and then she would have the password Rhodes Demo. And what I'll do is I'll give you guys a few seconds to get into that. Um, and I'll mention that what you'll want to do is actually open up three browser windows because you'll notice that we have three URLs here. One of the browser windows will be for the workshop instructions. The other one would be to get into the actual OpenShift data science platform. And the last one would actually be going into OpenShift Dedicated, uh, and you'll be using that to actually deploy some of your, um, to deploy your containerized application. So what these windows are going to look like is, again, if you go into column E on your spreadsheet, you're going to have the workplace, uh, sorry, workshop instructions. And these are the instructions that you're going to go through and we're going to go through some of them with you. Column F is going to bring you into the Red Hat OpenShift data science work area. And that's where we're going to be launching Jupyter Hub. And again, these instructions um, as what you click on in these, these various uh, browser windows, either for the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science uh, work area or within Red Hat OpenShift Dedicated, they're all going to be listed here within the workshop instructions. And then again, finally, column G, that's going to get you into the OpenShift Dedicated uh, platform. Okay. So I'm just going to ask this question, is there anybody that was unable to get the spreadsheet and to be able to pick a username to start with? You can uh, list that in the chat or within uh, the Q&A. Okay, it doesn't look like we have anybody who has had any issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop sharing my screen because I'm going to go ahead and get into the main, one of the main workshops so that I can show you what that's going to look like. wait for everything to catch up. If you open up that URL to get into the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science uh, Workshop, you're going to see an introduction. The way that this workshop is going to run is we're going to allow you the flexibility to run in and work through the workshop up until, let me check my notes here, until step five, um, when we start talking about how you're going to run an application, what we want to do is we want to have Carl to explain how we're using the API uh, with your prediction uh, dot pi, which would be a prediction function within your model. And then we're going to continue on then with Erwan talking about how you would set up your OpenShift dedicated environment. And again, those instructions are going to be in this OpenShift Data Science Workshop tutorial that we wanted to talk about a few things uh, within those steps just to make sure that everybody is okay with the actual steps that they're going to be performing. So we're probably going to give you around 15 minutes or so to work through the first bit of the workshop. Uh, that's going to uh, 
be able to take you right into choosing uh, an actual image to work with. And I'm not going to spoil the surprise for you. But again, once you get to approximately step five, you're going to pause and wait for us to kind of go through that information. And I'm just going to ask again, has everybody at least gotten to this point where they were op able to open up the workshop tutorial? If you haven't been able to open the workshop tutorial or the main OpenShift, Red Hat OpenShift uh, data science platform or work area, can you please let us know within the chat so that we can go ahead and give you some assistance? Okay, with that, you guys have 15 minutes. We'll reconvene at a quarter to the hour. And if you have any questions or comments, you know, please put them in the chat. And we want other people to see your questions and comments because they may be having some of the same, same challenges or same questions. Okay, so the URL to the lab, let me get that for you really quickly. So Carl or Erwan, do you have the bit.ly URL? Yep, you want me to paste yeah, it in the chat? Yeah, someone was asking for it. Okay, so uh, we'll do that. That should be coming. Right, so that's the URL to the main sheet. And then that sheet has the three links the instructions, the OpenShift console, the Rhodes console.
Hey, everybody. Just wanted to remind you all that we are available in the chat if you have any questions or any comments or, you know, we can respond to you directly there or happy to address it as it's probably a question other people have as well. So we have about five or six more minutes before we move on to the next step. We just want to make sure that everybody's had a chance to get through steps one through four.
All right. So it's about 15 till. I think at this point, unless there are any objections posted in the chat, I think we can move along to uh, step number five. So let me share my screen. All right. So step five, like the previous four steps, has everything you need when you come back to this workshop and you check it out for yourself, or you just want to, you know, refresh your memory in a couple months. But I would like to give some voiceover to what's actually happening here. So steps one through four, you had a chance to use a notebook environment to try out and build a new model. And notebooks work really well as an interactive tool. And they're specifically tailored for a data scientist doing data science workflows. But once you have a model running and working the way you want it to, really what uh, most groups do uh, is they will move that model into a production environment. Notebooks really aren't the best option for something like that. As you experienced, it's a manual tool. It's interactive. You execute a cell to run the code that you're looking for. What we would like to do instead is to serve our model using a RESTful API. We've chosen to do that using the quite famous Flask uh, tool set. So for those who aren't familiar, a RESTful API, it's really uh, very simple. It is an endpoint that you can make HTTP requests or post data to the API and have it return a result, but that result is based on the model that you just built, right? So it's pretty straightforward, but very, very effective in production environments. So the work that you've done, the model that you built, we can extract all of that code and put it into what we're calling a prediction.py file. The name doesn't matter. The important thing is, is that you've taken your interactive code and you moved it into a Python file that your Flask, Flask application, or in this case, the WSGI file, um, accessible in that left pane uh, in JupyterLab, that is, our Flask application will grab all of the code that's within your prediction.py file and use that in the headless production environment. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to check out that prediction.py file. You'll see that it's very similar to what you um, were just using in notebooks, I believe, uh, two and yeah, notebook number two. The WSGI file imports the pertinent functions and then exposes them through two RESTful API routes, so two URLs. So when we open up notebook number three, you'll see that we have a handful of system calls. One is to install the appropriate requirements, and then the second one is to launch the web service. Notebook number four is another notebook that we have set up so you can post data to your exposed endpoint. All right, so the notebook environment lets you build your application, your Flask application. You can test it on a local host, and then you can make calls or posts to post data to that endpoint and your model will run and return a result to you. That's all fantastic, but it's not exactly the production environment that we're looking for. You had to open the notebook and execute those cells manually, but in an environment like OpenShift, for example, we want a pod to and container to handle all of that automatically for us. And Air One, in the next step, will actually show you how you can string all of this together, use source to image and Git, 
as a DevOps workflow to put this into production. So I'm going to hang out here for a little bit to give you all a chance to run notebook number three. And once that's running, use notebook number four to make calls against the API. What do you think, Carl? Do you think they've had enough time to run these two notebooks? I think so. I have confidence in them. OK. All right. So I guess it's going to be my time to share my screen. Uh, let me see. Uh, OK. All right. All right, quick sanity check. Carl, you can see my screen okay? Not if you can. I can, that's great. Perfect, <laughs> thanks. All right, um, so at this point, um, so this is uh, step number six. Uh, you can see that here in the URL, packaging our application. So what Carl talked about is once we were done doing the work in the notebook, we package all of that as prediction.py. Now, what do we do with that? Do we email prediction.py to somebody and say, hey, you know, make it work? Um, no, that is so 2008. Um, there's probably not a very high chance that any of that would work uh, if you think about the dependencies, uh, what what version of Python it needs, uh, what packages, all these kinds of things. Uh, that's what containers exist for. So in step number six, that's what we do. We show an example on um, about how to package this application as a container image and then uh, how to deploy it. Now, there's multiple ways of doing it. The way we show here in this workshop uses this thing called source to image. So when you log in and uh, you create a project, uh, I think I had it somewhere on my screen. Um, too many tabs open as usual. All right. So when you click on this add button, you have the choice. You can you can add applications in many different ways. Uh, if uh, you like to live on the edge, you can just go, yep, I'm just going to type some YAML. That's the kind of person I am uh, from scratch, right? Um, nobody wants to do that. So I'm going to back out of that. And instead, what you're going to do as part of these uh, instructions is that you're going to deploy from Git. Um, now, I think I was looking, I think three or four of you have already done that. So kudos. If, if you haven't done it, um, I'm just prompting you now to move on to this exercise and just explaining quickly. What this is going to do is that it's going to reach out to your GitHub project and it's going to detect that it's a Python based project and it will do a few things almost simultaneously. It will take this famous prediction.py it will build a container image from it, and then it will deploy a pod from that. So that takes maybe a few minutes. Uh, obviously, it's going to depend on uh, the actual environment. Uh, but let me go back there, and let me go back to the topology screen. And eventually, this is what you want to see. Uh, if, if you see this, that 
is looking good. So this means that I have one running pod and it means that my, uh, my model has been deployed. Uh, if you click on this little guy here, you can see that this is the part that did the build. So I've built my image and then the pod is running from the built image. If I had made a change in my GitHub project, for example, I could just click on this start build and you would see here how it, it does a new build of the image. It's kind of useless here because I haven't changed anything, um, but it would rebuild the image and then it would get rid of the old pod and start a new pod from the new image. So it's a very fast and efficient way to iterate over um, those kinds of steps um, and an, a nice way of doing that. So I'll, okay, I'll scroll back up to the top here. Um, so I'll let you do this, uh, package your application, uh, you will see that it takes, yeah, the, the image build takes maybe two or three minutes before it's active. And then I'll go on mute to stop disturbing you while you're working on this. And we'll kind of reconvene in five minutes to do the testing part of this. And if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat.
Okay, so I think um, I see many of you have kicked off the build process. I, I can see it's not finished for everybody. Uh, so uh, if, if you're still working on that, keep, keep working on it. Uh, if you're waiting for the build to complete, then you can just listen to me. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to address a little bit what Arnab is asking about in the chat. Uh, where is the Docker file, right? Um, so yeah, if you've been working with containers, you might have used uh, Docker files uh, to create your own images. And usually this is something you might even do on your own laptop. Um, the source to image is uh, an alternative way of doing that where the build happens on the OpenShift cluster itself. Um, and it doesn't leverage Dockerfile in the same way. It um, really leverages kind of conventions and defaults uh, that allow you to uh, have those builds happen. Um, I think, do I still have it on my screen? Right. So here, what you see as am I this bigger, yeah. You see this screenshot here. Once you put in your Git project and it detects that it's a Python project, this is where it picks what's called the builder image version. Um, it's not exactly like the from in a Docker file, but it's, it's close enough um, in, in that sense. So all of this will happen straight on the cluster. There's nothing for you to do on your own laptop. And the image is going to be saved in the embedded registry in OpenShift. Um, yeah, so let me just see. Uh, what is the FT? Okay, I'll I'll put the GPU question aside from that for now, uh, but we'll we'll answer that in a minute. So so what does this do? Um, it as I explained, yes, it uh, creates a build. So this is my second build. Let me make that bigger for you. And then this is my running pod. Um, you only see one running pod, but when I got the new image, basically it got rid of the old one and uh, created a new one. And then the last thing here, oof, okay. Uh, the last thing you can see here is a route. And if you've uh, clicked on this hyperlink, uh, this, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, right? Status, okay, I'll take that any day. Um, uh, the interesting piece here is that this is a public facing URL. Uh, so you can you can send that to anybody. There's, I mean, currently it's it's wide open. You, you might not want it to be like that for real production workloads. Um, but anybody with a picture of a car could send it to this URL slash predictions and if we can detect the license plate, what they'll get in return is a license plate number. Uh, so how do we test that, right? So uh, if, you, if you got to the bottom of this, uh, ah, there we go, head to the next section to do the test, testing the application. So what we can do, um, I'm not gonna do it right now, but you can do this from your own workstation, right? So here, the, the URL would need to be modified, right? You would have to use your own private URL to be able to do that. But if you're on a Mac or a Linux machine, uh, you can pass an image to the URL and you'll get the license plate in return. Um, if you are on Windows, you can do the same thing with PowerShell. So the example that we have here, just so that we can be sure that everybody's able um, to do that. Uh, oh, um, okay, I'm seeing the question in the chat. I'll address that in a second. So uh, from a notebook, you can, uh, we have a notebook that's ready for this, uh, the number five. So I think I opened it earlier. Too many tabs, there we go. So this is notebook number five. And what you're gonna wanna do here is that you're gonna want to update this my route thing. And you're gonna wanna put in your own URL so that uh, it, it uh, hits your own environment, right? This user 151, that's me. So yours is gonna be slightly different. And then if you uh, run this, so I'll just rerun it from the top. Boom, boom, boom. So there we go. Prediction 
this is what I get in return. So when I pass this. Um, so the question in the chat, yeah, if you keep receiving crash loop back off, uh, let me see, can I toggle to yours here? I can't toggle to yours directly, but I can guide you through the process. So when you added the project, when you went here to Git, you were supposed to put in the URL and here you were supposed to put in the name of a specific branch. Uh, if you if you skipped over this, you're gonna get a crash loop back off. So how do we recover from that? Uh, one way, let me see, yeah, I believe here. Okay, let me just make sure. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So if you click on the, by the way, uh, your view might look more like this, but uh, either way, it, it doesn't matter. I like to see the, the graph view. So if you click on the little D there for deployment, and if you click on actions, edit, license, and such, this brings you back to the original import from Git. And so if you made a mistake here, if you forgot the app, you can type it in here and then you can click save. So that's a way to, if you, if you miss this step, this is how you get back to it. Uh, so once again, uh, you click on the deployment level here and then drop down here on the actions and then edit license, blah, 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 op.git. Okay, so hopefully that gets you out of trouble uh, if you're having this constant crash loop issue. Oh, and once you do that, uh, yeah, you, you probably are gonna want to uh, come back to the build screen and do start build again. All right, uh, so have you been able to run this send image? Okay. I tried both curl and 05 from notebook hitting internal server error. Okay, that should not be the case. So the first thing to verify will be that your route here is working. So when you select your app and you scroll down to the route, you wanna see this status okay. That's kind of the first step. You wanna make sure that when you copy, and paste this as your route. Put it the image from Google and it works. Oh, okay. Okay, so Honyin got some success there. That's good. Uh, let me see, CY10, let's see which user. Uh, so I think you are user 18. Projects. Let's take a quick look at this. Okay, so the status is okay here. Let me see. Let me test it out from my environment. Okay. All right, well, it works for me. So make sure that, yeah, make sure that you have the right reference to the right route. And then that should work for you as well. Okay. Okay, and to answer the question, yes, the Git reference should be app app lowercase. Any other questions or issues? OK. 
Okay. All right, so I think I'll let Audrey take over. Okay, everybody. So hopefully you've had the opportunity to work through the entire workshop material. If you are still working, that's okay. We are going to be online until half past the hour. So if you are still working, don't worry, keep on working, ask questions if you have them. And we really hope that you have learned something from the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science platform in terms that it is quite easy to go ahead and work on a model uh, go ahead and test out your model and actually go ahead then and deploy your mo model on OpenShift Dedicated. Oh yeah, so what is the NVIDIA supported model? Anything NVIDIA will work. How about AMD? So right now we just have um, this uh, working with uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, I believe that we're using V100s uh, and I don't have a link for anything else for the NVIDIA uh, support at this time. Uh, right within the actual uh, platform, I forgot to mention where you see the services, there is also the opportunity to look at documentation for the various internet service vendors. So you should be able to learn uh, a little bit more uh, about uh, NVIDIA there. And, and Chris is right. Uh, right now, this entire service line uh, is sitting on top of AWS, so it's public. So we don't have um, on-prem NVIDIA options at this time. However, that doesn't preclude you from testing out stuff locally on-prem if you have um, NVIDIA. You could always uh, use a PyCharm IDE or something like that to test out your model uh, there and test it against um, NVIDIA uh, GPUs on-prem and then move it over to uh, the cloud. And Chris just answered the, the other question. Yeah, and I'll just add to this that um, it's not enabled in this particular cluster, but when you're launching your notebook, um, if you have instances that have GPUs in them, then at the time of launching your notebook, you have to you have an option to choose, do you need GPUs or not? Uh, you, you probably didn't see it in this one just because we don't, but if there were some available, you, you would have been able to see that. And just a secret using those GPUs are awesome, right? <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> don't tell anybody, but it's awesome. No, uh, seriously, um, if you do have GPUs enabled, um, as Erwan mentioned, it would show up in that area when you're creating your image for your, your Jupyter notebook. So if you had one or two or three or four, could you be lucky to have as many as six, then you would be able to, to choose how many you wanted to, to work with at that time. All right, so again, we thank you very much for your time and attention uh, during this workshop. We are still going to be online until half past the hour. So we do encourage you if you're, you're still working to keep on working and try to finish up the workshop. And if you have any questions, please post them. We would be happy to answer them. Yep. But from all of us, thank you so much for attending our workshop today and trying out Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. And ha, huh, somebody said that it was easy. Yes, that is what we are striving for, easy. As a data scientist, I want things to be easy. I just want to worry about creating my code. So yes, thank you for that comment. So yes, we had the comment that uh, the model worked, but with more complicated uh, plates. Well, yeah, our model isn't totally perfect, um, but if you had this model and kept on training it, we would hope that it would be uh, 
very effective in, in reading the license plate numbers. And thank you, Sophie, for uh, dropping the URL. I was just going to to grab that. If you guys do want to learn more about Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, you can reach out to your own uh, account rep or the Red Hat um, account team uh, for more information on how you could uh, get access to the product. Right. That yeah, that would make sense because um, I use the default image, so it it worked for me. Uh, but if you put a picture of your own car and maybe the picture is blurry or something, maybe you wouldn't recognize it. So um, yeah, that could lead to that kind of result. Yeah, and I was just gonna say I tried that out with my own vehicle, um, and I think after the sixth uh, picture that I took and uploaded, I finally recognized it. But yeah. So you can drive into central London and not be worried about getting charged for it, I guess. At least this point in time. Yeah, it's a bit far, maybe. And just in case you wanted to double your introduction to Red Hat OpenShift, I've also included the link off of uh, Red Hat's main site. Um, and again, it's just a blog and it's going ahead and it's 
just kind of going over and touching on some of the points that we touched on in this workshop, just in case you want to like send that URL to your friends and say, I, you know, participated in this awesome workshop and this is the product that I learned about. Just in case. And I should mention that that blog was written by our famous Sophie Watson. So it'll be doubly worth your time to take a look at the blog. I can probably answer that question. So uh, the question is, what was the meaning of writing app in uh, Git reference? Uh, so uh, I was going to show you on my screen, which I'm not sharing. So that's not good. Um, so simply in this case, it's the name of the branch that we want to use. So the Git project that we use has multiple branches. There's main, there's app, there's doc. And the thing we want to pull in comes from the app branch. Um, but it is a Git reference. So it's usually very generic. You could put anything in there. Uh, you could put an actual commit, or you could put a, probably a Git label or something. But in our case, app is just the branch that we go in and get from the Git project. And uh, yeah. Oh, OK, good to know that it worked. Hmm. Hey, Erwan, are you looking at the question by Han Yen? Yeah, about the public DNS not yeah. being resolvable. That is surprising to me. Um, those route names should work from anywhere. Um, I, I haven't been able to test the PowerShell myself. Uh, maybe I'll need to spin up a Windows VM to test it out. Uh, but that should work anywhere, so. Okay, and uh, Florian, uh, that's a really good question regarding what the difference is between OpenShift, uh, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science and Open Data Hub. Uh, you can think of Open Data Hub as the beginning of it all. Uh, there was uh, such great interest in Open Data Hub that our fellow engineers and managers took a look at that and said, huh, it's like, why don't we actually elevate that service to actually work within the cloud and add more internet service uh, vendors to offer a lot more uh, products? So the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, it really is just an evolution from ODH.
So I'm uh, Hon Yin. I'm looking at the URL that you pasted in there, and it doesn't it doesn't look right because usually they have your user number in them. And I'm looking at your environment. You seem to be user eight. So that was the URL I was expecting you would have. So I'm not sure where that license plate works. I'm not sure which one that's coming from. Hmm. All right, so we've come up on the end of our workshop. Uh, again, we do thank you for your, your interest and time in being with us today. And there were a lot of great questions, so thank you so much for those, those questions. Those were very insightful. And remember, if you do have um, some more questions, you can <laughs> reach out to your account executive or to us. And sorry, I have some anxious uh, dogs because they didn't get their WALK this morning since I was up so early at 5.30. So, yes, we are. <laughs> yes, I was in agreement. <laughs> so again, thank you so much, everybody. And um, we hope that you enjoy your journey uh, using Red Hat OpenShift data science. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.